Hey folks, Mrs. White here. Today our video is going to be pretty quick. We're going to go over the chapter 11 test topics. It's nice. Um, this test is only going to cover chapter 11, so the review isn't going to be super duper intense. Hopefully you'll be feeling good about it when we're done this video and or done office hours tomorrow. Um, so we're going to spend a couple minutes at first talking about what you're going to see on the test. We'll go over the answers to our chapter 11 quiz. So if you have not submitted that already, um, in order to submit and get a grade for the chapter 11 quiz, you'll have to do the retake, okay, since I'm clearly going to be going over the answers right now. Um, so we'll go over the topics, we'll go over the quiz, and then I'm going to let you know there are going to be a couple resources you will have access to. Um, when you take this test um, because Miss Ross lets her kids do it so I want to make sure you have the same leg up that they do so we'll talk about that at the very end of the video I'm also going to let you know when um, I'm going to be assigning the test and when it's due and we'll have kind of a quick little discussion about that also if you have any questions about anything in this video or about the test feel free to email but I'd really prefer folks that you either post your questions on the Google Classroom because other people might have the same question or show up to office hours. I'm happy to answer questions there and it saves me a lot of time from uh, having to answer several emails that might ask the same thing. So let's start off by talking about our topics. Um, this is not necessarily chronological for the test. However, this section right here is going to be your first three questions. You're going to be asked, you're going to be given a situation, and you're going to be asked to identify if your sampling strategies are independent or dependent of each other. And then, is the data going to be qualitative or quantitative? So if any of that feels like you might be a little unsure, that was the first section that we started in. That's going to be section 11.1. So you feel free to revisit that in your book or the video or your notes. Um, there's also a bunch of good practice problems in the first um, part of that homework section too, where you can be looking at independent, dependent, and qualitative, quantitative. So feel free to check that out. The next few things are kind of all intermingled together. Um, hypothesis testing, figuring out confidence intervals, and um, figuring out an appropriate sample size. So let's start off by talking about hypothesis testing. Everything on this test is looking at two samples. Okay, you're never going to be hypothesis testing one sample. That was chapter 10. Chapter 11 focuses specifically on two samples, so everything is going to be two samples that are either independent or dependent. Um, you could have proportions, which are going to be two samples. And kind of an inclination for that you're dealing with proportions is they're going to give you like uh, an X value and an N value for each of your samples. And hopefully that means something to you because that's how you would make your P hats. Okay. So you'd be looking at kind of a piece over a hole and a piece over a hole. Next, if you're dealing with means, okay, um, they're going to be giving you averages. You're going to be dealing with potentially raw data. Um, and every time that you think you're dealing with a mean, you need to also determine, are you having independent or dependent means? So dependent means, again, could be called a matched pair. Um, and a matched pair happens when you have your first sample and your second sample that you get is directly related to that first one. Okay, so um, we'll talk about that a little bit. We see one or two of those in your quiz, and you'll need to be able to identify that in your test. And if they're independent, they're samples that are taken totally independent of each other. Uh, the next type of hypothesis testing is standard deviation. You'll know that you're dealing with a standard deviation because it will say in the directions that it's a standard deviation. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, this one's the only one that's really going to use that terminology. Next, you're going to have confidence intervals. Um, you'll have to make a choice about which of these two to use. You could have a confidence interval with a proportion, so you want to check that out. You also could have a confidence interval that involves means. And again, every time you're dealing with means, it could be dependent or independent. Um, again, these are just keystrokes, folks. All of this stuff here is just keystrokes. You just need to know where to go to look for um, the answers in your calculator, okay? Um, the last piece, and I'll let you know there's only one of these questions, you're going to be asked to determine the sample size given a, a so, sort of a proportion, okay? And there's two formulas for that. Neither of those formulas are on um, 
any reference material. So you want to make sure that if there's something that you really study, you figure out your keystrokes, you look at these kind of four vocab terms, and then when it comes to sample size, you spend some time memorizing those two formulas and when you would use each. So your test is only 10 questions. Um, not every question is worth the same. Um, like the vocab ones are worth a little bit less. Uh, confidence intervals are worth a little bit less. The whole hypothesis test is worth a little bit more in sample sizes. So what happens is that it all kind of becomes about 46 points. Okay, so to get your percentage, we'll take the amount you get correct over your 46 points. And then, just like in the last assessment, there's going to be um, opportunities for six bonus points. And those six bonus points are going to be only percentages. So it's not like if you get a 44, you're going to suddenly get a um, 50 out of 46. It's going to be you get a 44 out of 46. I'll divide that out, get the decimal equivalent, and then add 6% um, of worth of bonus points to it if you can earn all six. And again, those are going to be um, based off of giving me both the p-value and the critical value. Okay, I am not going to um, require that you show both on your test. I didn't last time, um, so I'm not going to this time. Okay, but again, I, that's a great opportunity, especially when we deal with standard deviations. Those are really hard. That's a bonus point well earned for sure. So now that we've talked about the topics, a little bit of what you can expect from the test, um, let's take a look at your quiz. Um, for each of these problems, I did put which section in the book you could look at as reference if you need to. Uh, I'm just going to talk you through the general process for these. So looking at this problem right off the bat, I notice that I have a sample size and I'm given an x value. And I'm given a secondary sample size and another x value. So right now I am deciding that that's a proportion because they're giving me the information I would need to create a proportion and that it's two samples. So um, I know that I'm going to be using two prop Z test. This question here is a question you're going to see on your exam, okay? So that's a nice, quick, and easy one um, for you to just decide, you know, and write down what is going to be your keystrokes for that and why do you think that. So it's clearly proportions. We're doing two samples, so two prop C test. Um, in fact, your test is set up very, very similar to this for all the hypothesis testing questions. So your null is always in a proportion that the two proportions are equivalent. Um, your alternative could be that one proportion is larger than the other. Maybe this proportion is smaller than P2 or not equal to. In this problem specifically, they told us that it's not equal to, so I knew that was going to be my alternative. Next, I'm going to take my X1 and my N1 and my X2 and my N2, and I'm going to plug those into the um, statistics piece of this, okay, because I don't have raw data. And... Um, I'm going to crunch some numbers, so that's going to give me my test statistic, which hopefully you um, also had, and it's going to give me my p-value, okay? Now, this I just wrote this wrong on my key, but everything else here is right. Um, once you have your p-value, you're going to take that number, and you're going to set it less than your alpha, and our alpha here is 0.01, so 0.24 is not less than 0.01, so I put no. That means there is not enough evidence to accept the alternative. I'm going to then um, keep the null, okay? If I was doing this with critical values, which the critical value is how you can earn that extra point, or the p-value, if you do both of those on your test, that's where you earn it. Um, to get your critical values, again, since we're dealing with proportions and we're dealing with a z-score, we're going to head to the back of our book, in table five, you're going to go all the way down to the bottom corner. Bottom right-hand corner helps you do hypothesis testing critical values. We have an alpha value of 0.01, and you're going to go all the way over to where it says two-tailed, and it's going to give you this number right here, plus or minus 2.575. So that means this boundary here is positive 2.5, this one here is negative 2.5, and you can see negative 1.17 is going to fall in between those, not in the shaded region. So again, it's giving me a null, it's telling me there's not enough evidence to reject the null and accept the alternative. Okay, so I keep the null. Um, if this was a situation where they gave us an actual word problem, I would have to word it, word it in a way that was like there's not enough evidence at a 0.01 level of significance to say blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, second question, if we look at this problem, um, and again, this is where things can get a little hairy when we have to make a decision about which strategy to do when. Okay, so let's actually read this. Uh, a random sample 
of size n equals 13 is obtained from a population, they tell us it's already normally distributed, and results in a sample mean of 45.3 and a sample standard deviation of 12.4. An, an independent sample uh, of size n equals 18 is obtained from a population that is normally distributed also with a sample mean of 52.1 and a sample standard deviation of 14.7. So right now it's telling us that it's independent and they're giving us calculations for the mean, okay? They also say in our actual question of about doing the hypothesis testing, do these means differ, okay? So I know I'm dealing with two samples, I know I'm dealing with means, and they specifically said independent, so I didn't have to worry too much about that. Because of all of this information, I'm gonna run my two sample t-test, and, um, and that's where I go from there, okay? Your null in this situation, because they are independent, is that one mean equals the other. And then this one, they want to know if the two means are different. So that's going to be a two-tailed test. So it's going to be does not equal here. Okay. Now, if we were dealing with a dependent mean, okay, that would also be called a matched pair situation. We would do M1 minus M2 would equal zero, which means that there's no change in between them. And then we would also have some sort of subtraction stuff going on here. Okay? Anyways, it says independent, so we're not worried about that. This is the test we're going to run. So we plug in all of this information, our mean, our standard deviation, and your sample size into your calculator for both your first sample and your second. That will give you your test statistic. That will give you your p-value. Um, so you'll take that p-value right there. Compare it to your level of significance. Again, it is not less than our level of significance, which means there's not enough evidence to reject the null. I accept the null, and I would write a sentence starting with, there is not enough evidence at a 0.05 level of significance to say blah, 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 blah. If we're doing this the classical method, we're going to take our test statistic, and we have to find our critical values. So we're going to go to the back of our book. We're going to go look where... Um, since we're dealing with T, we can't just look at a specific table. We're going to go to table 7, okay, in the back of your book. And you're going to have to identify your degrees of freedom. Now, when you have two samples, you always take your smallest degrees of freedom, and that's going to be what you reference in the book. So I'm going to go to 12 degrees of freedom on the left, and I'm going to trace it over to and you have to be careful here, okay, um, 0.025, because 5% is split between the two tails, okay? So I'm going to go 12, I'm going to go over to 0.025, and I see that my values are going to be positive 2.179, and then this one over here is just the same negative, so negative 2.179. This negative 1.3 would fall in between the positive 2 and the negative 2, so it's not in the shaded region. So again, that reinforces our idea that there's not enough evidence to accept uh, the alternative, so we, would, we accept the null instead. Again, if we're dealing with um, an independent mean, that's section 11.3. If that's tricky for you, uh, take a look there. Number three, they give us a bunch of information, no word problem, but they tell us that do these standard deviations differ? So we know that we're dealing with standard deviations. We have two samples. So we're going to do two sample F test because we're going to be uh, dealing with F as our uh, test statistic. Okay. So our null is that our two standard deviations are the same. They use the word differ, not that one has to be bigger or smaller, so that's going to be does not equal again. And we're going to plug all of this information into our sample um, F test, our two sample F test in our calculator. And that's going to give us our F score, and that's going to give us our P value. So if we look at the P value and compare it to our alpha, it is smaller. So yes, there's enough evidence to reject the null and accept our alternative. If we look at classical method, and the critical value here is very tricky, you're going to go to A16 or A19 in the back of your book, and I'll make sure to scan those and add those to your packet so that you're able to use that during the test also. Um, or if you have your book, you're welcome to flag those. I'll make sure your parents know that you could be looking at tables towards the back of the book um, to get those specific critical values for this. Your F curve, if you remember it, is going to be, I kind of drew it symmetric, but really it should be skewed to one side. Um, we're going to have, since it does not equal, it's two-tailed. 
we're going to have an F score here that corresponds to 0.025, half of that area. And I put my sample 1 degrees of freedom and my sample 2 degrees of freedom here. Okay, and then I have to use um, that table in the back of the book. To do anything that's going to be shaded to the left, I'm going to do 1 over almost the exact same thing, except I flip-flop my numerator and denominator numbers. So when I went to go find this one in the back of the book, I had to, they didn't have 59 and they didn't have 56. So you have to choose the numbers that are closest that are represented on the table. So 60 for the numerator was the closest and they didn't have 60 for the denominator, but they did have 50. So I end up um, with a critical value of 1.72 for my upper bound. And then my lower here is going to be one over um, f of 0.025, but I kind of flip-flop those two numbers, right? So instead of being able to do, um, it ends up being the same anyways, because here your only options are 60, and here the only option is 50 and 100, so you'd stick with 50. So I ended up still with 1 over 1.72, which became 0.5814. So these two are my critical values for my F curve, okay? Um, and if you look at that, my test statistic 1.8 is in this side of my shaded region since this boundary here is 1.72. It is in the shaded region, so the answer is yes, so we can reject the null. There is enough evidence to um, say at a 0.05 level of significance that they are, the standard deviations are different. Getting there. So this is section 11.2. Um, what is the typical age difference between husband and wife? So when they say typical, that's implying that it's going to be a mean. And they're asking specifically for a difference between a husband and a wife. So if they're saying difference like this, and it's kind of a pair of people that would go together or a situation where it's connected to the same person, because remember, it doesn't have to be two separate people. It could be the same person. That is going to imply that it's going to be a dependent situation that is also called matched pairs, okay? And that's how you kind of identify it in this specific problem, right? You, the wife is dependent on the husband. The husband being in the study could be dependent on the wife, depending on who's chosen first. So um, they collect this information. It's a dependent mean. So I use the t-test, and when I input this data, I also do the difference, right? I take old minus the young, and I put that in my L3 in my calculator. And L3 becomes where I run all of my hypothesis tests through. Okay, so when I do the t-test, I'm going to make sure that the list I'm using is L3 by pressing second 3 to get an L3 there. The um, null and the alternative here are in a very specific way because you're dealing with a dependent. Um, you're looking at the mean difference and you're looking at the mean difference here. And these can be tricky, especially the alternative. Your null is going to be that it always equals zero, that there's no difference between the two numbers. But your alternative is kind of funky, okay? If husband is in the first group and wife is in the second group, and we want to prove um, that wives are typically younger than their husbands, if we took L1 and we took, subtracted L2, okay, um, and that became our difference, if someone's older, their age is going to be larger, okay? If um, someone's younger, their age is going to be a smaller number, right? So if you have a larger number and you subtract a smaller number from it, you should end up with a positive. So we're looking at our difference being greater than zero. That would imply that the husbands from our list one are older when we subtracted their wife's age from theirs, okay? Now, this problem was tricky. They did not give us an alpha value, okay? But if you remember back in the day, we talked about when certain alpha values would be used. 0.05 and 0.10 were very low risk alpha values. If we're looking at whether a medication works or causes extreme um, side effects, we would probably use 0.01 or um, something less than that, right? So we could say in this problem, it would probably be a 0.05 or a 0.10. You are not gonna have one of those you know, guess which alpha value you're doing on your test. All of the hypothesis testing problems give you an alpha value. I double checked that, so it's not something you're gonna have to worry about it. But it's something we had seen a lot in our previous test, so I didn't modify it in this quiz just so we could have this conversation. Okay, 
So um, we'd plug in our L3 into our t-test to get our test statistic and to get our p-value. And this p-value is like 4, uh, 0.04 or 4%. And that is going to be less than both of these low-risk numbers that we would use for our alpha. Okay, could we do 0.01? Yes, we could, and then it would be null, or it would be um, no, there's not, so you would accept your null. Okay, but here, because this isn't a high stress situation, we don't have to have a 1% chance of making an error. It's not that extreme. Okay, so um, we do see that 0.04 is less than 0.05 or 0.10, um, so we would say that there is enough evidence to reject our null and accept our alternative we would say that uh, husbands are generally older than their wives. Now, if we did this with our um, classical method, we find our critical values. Um, we are going to use table 7 again in the back. You're going to do degrees of freedom. For both of these, it was 8 as our sample size, so our degrees of freedom is 7. And you're going to use, you could do 0.05. Um, you would get this. If you did 0.10, you would get this. Either way, this number, again, is going to be bigger than that, right? Regardless of what those two numbers are, point or 2.0 is going to be higher than them. It's going to be in the shaded region. So it's both going to be yes for that one also. Okay. So that just reinforces our p-value stuff. The last problem on your quiz um, has you looking at um, a rate of return, okay, from sample stocks. They're telling you that it is an independent sample, okay? So um, it doesn't say standard deviation, so I'm not. I am just going to go independent mean with this one, okay? So I have two samples, independent. They're giving us raw data, so I'm implying that it's a mean. Um, so I'm going to use my two sample t-test. My null is that both of the means are equal. When they're independent, I don't have to calculate the difference like I did in the previous problem, okay? Um, I'm going to look, this mean cannot equal the other because they ask me if there's a difference between the two. And then I just plug in all of this into my L1. I plugged all of this into my L2. I do not need to do an L3 list if it's independent, but I do need to do two sample t-tests. That's going to give me, this is my test statistic. It gives me, this is my p-value. Um, they chose 0.10 as a level of significance. So clearly that is not less than 0.10. And if we look at this compared to the critical value, again, we do degrees of freedom of our smallest sample, which was 18 here, right? Our, uh, our degrees of freedom here is 19. We always choose the smallest. Um, and I find those two uh, t-scores related to degrees of freedom and being uh, 0.025. And that becomes plus or minus 2.101. This negative number is in between the positive 2 and the negative 2. And so it's not in the shaded region, so there's not enough evidence to accept the alternative. I then accept the null. Okay, so I assume that um, these two things are the same, that there's not really a difference between the two. So that kind of ties up all of the quiz problems, all the hypothesis testing stuff that you could potentially see. Um, items that you're going to be able to use on your test is going to be obviously your graphing calculator. Um, you're going to be able to use those packets that are from the back of your book. So if you have the back of your book insert with you, please do not rip it out. Um, you're welcome to just reference it. If you're going to look at the one I have online and or print it out, I'm going to add to it your A16 um, through the A19, which are how you find your critical values if you're dealing with a standard deviation. Okay, so that's going to be like our F, our F values there. Um, I also have a note sheet that I'm going to attach to this that was what uh, Mrs. Ross allows her kids to use um, in Monmouth. And, you know, even though we only have one section on this, I feel like if she let them use it, I'm going to let you use it too. Um, but I'm hoping that a lot of the stuff, because it's been so fresh and it's not been a while, we haven't covered multiple chapters, is is pretty good to go and you might not have to reference those notes very much. So again, you're going to be able to use your graphing calculator. You're going to be able to use the packet that I'm going to also attach to this, which is the um, insert in the back of your book plus pages A16, 17, 18, and A19. And then I'm going to attach the handwritten notes that Mrs. Ross lets her students use. Um, this test is really nice. Okay, I feel like it's very, very reasonable. Um, I took just the questions straight up that were from this chapter, from the overarching test, and made it its own assessment. So it's not written by me. Um, it's just the 
portion of the larger test that you would be taking with this chapter. Okay, so here's how the test is going to work. Next week is break. Okay, um, so you have two options. You are so ready to take that test, like within the next day, two days, tonight, I don't care. Okay, when you feel like you are ready to take that test, if it is soon, you're going to have a parent email me um, saying that they are going to proctor your assessment and um, when they're planning on doing that. And I will email them the test and you can take it as soon as you would like. So say you watch this, say you look over your quiz, you're like, man, I did great on that. I'm feeling awesome about this. I want to take the test today. I want to take it tomorrow, which would be Friday. Maybe you decide to hang out for office hours, ask some questions, and then take it. Who knows, okay? You are welcome to take that test as soon as you would like. Um, I'm cool with it. Your second option, which is your deadline for your test. We have vacation next week, okay? So the idea for this one is that you um, take your vacation as you see fit which I am perfectly fine with. You decide you want to do a little bit more studying over vacation. And then Monday that we get back from break, which happens to be the 27th, your parents proctor your test for you and you submit it by the 28th at midnight. Okay, so this 28th, is the absolute deadline for that test. I don't want that test sitting in your parents' inbox for two weeks. Once I send it to them, I'd like to get it back within 24 or 48 hours, okay? It only is 10 questions. It's a lot smaller. Um, you're allowed to have these materials on it. I wanna make sure that um, it's getting done in a reasonable amount of time and submitted, okay? So again, your two options are you decide you're ready and you wanna take it before vacation or even during the beginning of vacation, okay? I am totally kosher with that. Perfect, awesome, great. You decide that you wanna take your vacation as it is. I'm totally cool with that too. Doesn't matter to me, I'm on house arrest just like all of you folks, so it does not make sense um, to for you to hold off if you're ready. It does not make sense if you wanna study more and you're given a vacation to not take that vacation to study, okay? If you decide to not work on it over vacation, or um, before vacation starts, then you will be taking it on Monday the 27th and making sure to submit it by the 28th before midnight, okay? This test will be averaged with your chapter 12 test and that will become the grade for your test four, okay? Just so you kind of have an idea of how that will work. Um, so hopefully this makes sense. I'm making this test very, very flexible as far as time. If you're ready, take it sooner, right? Don't wait, take it sooner. Okay, let me know what your plan is. I will potentially see you folks tomorrow for office hours, 4 to 5 p.m. See you later.